we met in Amsterdam over at Anna Mika, Anna Mika's place. And, um, and I was, I remember we went out, I remember I was really tired that night and we, we went out and we went to, uh, uh, just a local bar. God, everything in Amsterdam is so old and has so much character. What a great yeah. city. What a the great apple city. pie. You have to remember the apple pie. Oh, God, though. that was good. Yeah. <laughs> the <laughs> apple pie. <laughs> Yeah, and that was, we, we, uh, I think it was right after the SAN conference, in uh, the first SAN right, conference yeah. in Europe as well. We had the, uh, yeah, we were all at the conference. And, um, yeah. and, and then I know and, about and, you through mainly through, through Chuck, because uh, Chuck and I are very good friends. Right, yeah, and that's how I know you, through Chuck. Chuck must yeah. have said you got to check out Gino, you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and we had, we had a brief time there in Amsterdam. It was kind of an intense time, though. We went out, which, yeah, yeah you're probably an intense guy. Oh, oh, thank are, you. Are you? I, th I guess you are. I think well, it's good because you know we. God knows what could happen when we get when we get together in an interview like this. So, just a more formal uh, introduction. Let me just flip to your Huffington Post page again. Yeah, you've written articles for Huffington Post. That's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, I know Ariana through uh, Ted. You know, I've, I've uh, been to the TED conference. We've had a few meals together. She's pretty okay. big on consciousness herself. Her um, entire publication has more on consciousness and non-duality than yeah. any, what I would call a, a mainstream publication. I, I consider Huffington yeah, Post. Uh, yeah. Let me, uh, let me just she's do. Pretty switched on. Let me just do a little formal stuff. Then I want to, all kinds of stuff I want to ask you. So uh, we're speaking to Dr. Gino Yu, and you're, uh, as, as you mentioned earlier, you're a, um, an associate professor and director of digital entertainment and game development in the School of Design at Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Is that pretty close? Yeah. Yeah. And um, you have a family, right? You have some kids and yeah. everything. And, and so it's late. Is it too late to, for you to talk? I didn't realize. You know, no, no I, I'm there. fine. It's, uh, mainly, you know, I'm preparing this Europe tour. And uh, so it's just now is a good time to catch up with all the people that are there. I want to talk about that. But I just have a general question. A general question. You travel a lot. How do you get away so much? Is it part of your job, part of your uh, academic work? Well, it's that. And I get invited to speak a lot. And um, and then uh, my, my wife, we have a we're, we have a nice house here and, and I've got young kids, but we have a. Uh, we have nannies, and and my wife is pretty active, and I'm pretty active too with with the kids. We just yeah. took the kids to Europe, yeah. as a matter of fact. Um, but uh, right now, especially, it's a really exciting time related to you know all this stuff on consciousness and neuroscience, and you know there's a lot to to learn and a lot of really interesting people to see. Yeah. And so uh, just yeah. kind of been playing along. Tell me more. <laughs> Tell me more about Ariana Huffington and the TED conferences. You, you, you mentioned those already. And TED, of course, people are fascinated with that. Ariana Huffington is has to be a fascinating person, especially you said she's interested yeah. in consciousness and she's interfacing with the mainstream. I mean, she is main, the mainstream, part of the mainstream. So yeah. just tell me a little bit more about her and um, anything you'd like to share that you can share publicly. Well, she, she's a great she's a great subject for you. I mean, she's uh, she's very ex fairly accessible as well too. Um, but she travels in these circles. So you know, next month or actually later this month, I'm going to Davos, and she'll probably be there. Um, mm -hmm. And then the, I've seen her at the Cannes Lion Festival, at the TED conference, and um, all of these different places. And a lot of the stuff that she talks about are related to wellness. And I think it, a large part it has to do with. Uh, her rise to success with the Huffington Post, and then just personally, you know, going through the family things that she's done and having to reconcile a lot of the the things that usually happen in people's lives uh, that are that are fairly driven. But hmm. a large part of of entrepreneurship, and and so I, I'm doing this tour. We're, we're giving a lot of talks related to entrepreneurship, innovation, and self discovery. Is especially for an entrepreneur, you're, you're actually moving into the unknown and you're learning to work in the unknown. And there's a lot of energy behind it, especially when there's a lot of money and a lot of meaning tied around, you know, what you're doing. And things will either flow or they don't. And the successful ones kind of learn to flow and, and really learn to connect with their their intuition and and work from that. And so if you talk to a lot of very successful entrepreneurs, 
you know, A, it's driven by, hey, I want to make whatever the stories are that drive them. But in order to perform kind of and to execute at that level requires a lot of a lot of energy and concentration and discipline and a lot of the things that you normally consider a tribute to like a yogi or someone, mm -hmm. you know, on a spiritual path. The entrepreneur is actually doing the same thing in terms of yeah. foregoing a lot of things that normal people would 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 uh, treasure, like the quiet nights and the, the meals and the time with family, et cetera. So, so, well, so she's gone through this process and, you know, from her family thing. And then it was really quite interesting because when you go to Ted, you know, my, my definition of Ted is it's, it's a church for atheists. <laughs> yeah. But if you go there, they design these experiences where it's highly intellectual, but then they in integrate all of this art stuff and these emotional stories. So you have people almost like in a church and, and people are transformed by the experience. And it was really quite interesting. I have several very good friends that I met at TED, but uh, in uh, 2009, they had a thing where they had a birds of a feather uh, event mm -hmm. where people would organize lunches around specific topics and I threw one out around consciousness. And I figured at TED, you know, you have all these high achievers, successful people that, you know, that would be an interesting area. And there are certain people. So if you talk to Donna Karen or, or if you talk to Goldie Hawn or, you know, there is a small community of people that are that are into consciousness and, and meditation and, and, and these kind of practices. But a large part of those people, I, I was surprised, are really hardcore type A overachievers. And mm -hmm. so they're really driven energetically and they're very successful and they're still driven by the stories that you know, Bill Gates trying to do what he's doing, or Al Gore, or, or any of the Google people, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was surprising just the 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 <laughs> the, uh, the the few people that were really into consciousness. But the ones that we networked, I networked with there. One is a guy named Nick Udall who runs this thing called the Nowhere Group in the UK, who organize. Uh, they facilitate organizational transformation with Fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. And another guy, Javier uh, Moreno Valle, who had gone through a, a massive upheaval with his business. And, you know, that has brought him to kind of this study of consciousness. Um, but they're all, you know, really, really good people. But it was interesting. So in 2010, I, I actually had a three minute opportunity to give a talk on the main stage at TED. And and I, I tried to bring in <laughs> the best that I could from a scientific perspective, some of these uh, spiritual values. And, you know, actually, I quote Christian Murdy in that. And, and, mm -hmm. and the, the talk is focused on, you know, over, looking at the odds that we face and, you know, the idea of rather than looking in or, uh, objectively in the external, you know, doing the inner journey and, and working from the innate joy of being. That was the nut of my talk. But uh, and then that went over fairly well. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a tough crowd. Consciousness. And sure. then now, well, and then now among that crowd, you probably know there's the controversy over, uh, um, over you know the talks. There was a TEDx. I also curate mm. TEDx Hong Kong. About 850 people at the last one, and we do two, two events a year here in Hong Kong. But they tried to do a TEDx West Hollywood, where they had, um, they had some people uh, that were kind of from ions and you know fringe science. What would be mm -hmm. considered fringe science? And that was shut down and led to a big discussion over, you know, what is science and what is the value of TED and everything. But, uh, you know, one of the people, <laughs> one of the people on the on the advisory board for uh, for uh, for the for TED is uh, a guy named Dan Dennett. And uh, that's for those of you that are into consciousness and, and the science of consciousness. That's kind of all you really need to say. <laughs> really? Um so what's that like for you curating a TEDx? You feel any pressure? Or, but you're, you're pretty scientifically um, based anyway. So yeah, yeah, I, I, I kind of well, and I, and part of what I'm trying to do now, and I guess what we'll talk about are too, is how do you, whether it's science or religion, they're all just languages. And so the question is, how do you, how do you communicate experience, and you know, how do you take these kind of perennial knowledge and and just put it into new new languages? And so uh, a lot of the stuff that we're doing right now is is really taking Western scientific approaches to, to studying these Eastern traditions and practices. Yeah. 
But when you were talking, uh, God, you talk, you already covered a lot. And I just made a note on uh, creativity when you were talking earlier yeah. about entrepreneurship and yeah. and the need to enter the unknown to um, really to flow with your intuition. And this, this basically, you know, sounds like the uh, the roots of creativity. Um, and I was watching the business station here in uh, the Canadian business station. They were interviewing. Uh, um, a guy named Peter Monk who founded Barrick uh, uh, Mining. They have gold mines, a very established uh, a mining company, an older man now. He must be well into his 70s and he's a retired CEO. And they asked him, well, you know, why he started Barrick. Um, he said, well, I wanted to create something. Really, really simple. Yeah, there, there's, there's a guy, there's an example of creativity at the root of entrepreneurship well, creativity is one thing, but creativity, you know, a lot of people are creative in terms of coming up with ideas. And the interesting thing that uh, that guy, the, the guy that you just mentioned did was he took the idea and he did something with it. I mean, he literally created something, Yeah. you know, which which is beyond just creativity. That's that's innovation. Creativity is just anybody can have ideas, but then to take those ideas and then turn them into something that people can appreciate and you can share with the rest of the world that's that's innovation well yeah he really um, understated, and, he really understated he said well i wanted to create something you know created a major you know, major company major industry and um uh but it would be interesting if the people in, if the guy interviewing him did get into you know the roots of that creativity but of course yeah. you, don't, you don't see that uh, uh in the mainstream or even not even like you said going to uh, some of these conferences even to talk on in, on the level of consciousness itself isn't that common? Yeah, and it's a challenge. So the class, I only teach one. So I oversee a master's program here, and we, we focus on startups and innovation, and, and we, we run an incubator as well, too. Um, on the research side, I'll just take an aside. We're, we're working with some, I'm working with some of the top robotics people in the world right now, a guy named David Hansen of Hansen Robotics, who does the most realistic faces in the world, a guy named Mark Tilden, who specializes in bodies, and a guy named Ben Gertzel, who who's one of the top people in artificial general intelligence. And we see kind of robotics as kind of the future from a technology perspective. The argument here is we've kind of reached the limit on what you can do with the screen. And so especially as we move from IQ to EQ, the importance of EQ in, in society and everything, uh, these emotive re robotics are, are uh, kind of uh, the next wave of technology, especially in education and healthcare and kind of the services industries. So we're doing a lot of that kind of fun stuff. But on the teaching side, so I oversee this master's program focused on startups. But on the teaching side, I only teach one class these days. And I've been teaching it for the last eight years, which is a class called Recovering Creativity. Mm -hmm. And they've done studies, I think, in Singapore, where kids at the age of five, based upon divergent thinking tests, they're like 90 percent creative. And by the time they reach 17, they're only 10% creative. And so the question is, what happens between the age of 5 and 17? And then given that that's happened, how do you recover it? Mm. And so the argument here is that when you're born, you're innately creative. But then what happens is you start buying into a conditioned worldview. So through your parents, through society, through traditional education and the media, you build a mentally constructed worldview that you perceive as the reality and that kind of encages you in, in some way and so the question the way to get out of that is to really start loosening kind of the grip the emotional attachments to the ideas and the beliefs um, and if you can let them all go that's uh, that's what we try to facilitate and we provide a, a framework for, for doing this um, mm -hmm. in a university and the wild thing for me is <laughs> normally you know just between you and me, although it's it's being broadcast now, so I have to be a little bit careful. But you know, it's stuff that would normally be taught in spirituality or in you know, which in the United States and other places could get in a, in an institution like a university could get you into trouble. But uh, I'm a professor in a design school, and when you talk about design, you're talking about innovation and ideas and creativity. <laughs> and it all comes from the realm of the mind. And then, well, what's mm -hmm. the realm of the mind? <laughs> And you, so then, you know, that's where I bring the, the Western sciences perspective and, and a rational uh, argument to uh, to 
constructing mentally constructed worldviews. How tricky do you find that to be? Well, it's very tricky, and and so and the the big difference for this too is, is there's a difference between knowing something intellectually and knowing something experientially, and so I can talk about a lot of stuff, but then it really is 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 the knowledge embodied. And is it an experiential knowing? And so with that comes a lot for this class that I teach come a lot of experiential exercises and, and things to to and, and I think we've got a pretty good framework. You know, I've been working on this class for about eight years now. And in this whole area of uh, kind of transformation and enlightenment that we're doing research in in understanding the mind body relationship and consciousness we've been doing for quite some time and then I personally have been on this path for you know 25 years or so yeah and that's work with Jeffrey Martin I guess work on transformation and enlightenment well, so, well, there's Jeffrey Martin, there's there's a Peter Fennick in, in the UK uh, there's a Bruce Damer now in in uh, in uh, in and there's a Mikey Siegel as well too uh, near Santa Cruz. And, you know, there's a, a network of, of people that are kind of working in this area. Are they also and, associated with universities? Uh, not all, all of them. Big, yeah. um, and, and now, you know, with events, yeah, it's challenging. Too. And then we had the, the mind and life people were just here, uh, Richard Davidson and uh, the new head, the guy that <coughs> replaced Adam Engel. Um, and, and the cool thing is they're looking at expanding into Asia and so there have been communities. Um, hopefully, I'm seeing Tanya Singer in, in Munich uh, next week as well, too. But there, there, there are researchers all around, especially the, the Dalai Lama and the Mind Life people have been, you know, bringing scientists and, and, and kind of Eastern tradition practice people together for the last 15, 20 years or so, at least. <laughs> Let me just go. You, you mentioned your own search for twenty for twenty five years, your own spiritual search, yeah. and uh, I, yeah. I, you know we need to talk about it because uh, <laughs> people want to hear about. It. I've okay. never heard, I've never heard any of your story, and I know you're very involved just in your work and your in your travels and all your projects. Yeah. But um, have you told much about that story to people, or kind of your, your personal Not journey? Not too much. Not too much, but uh, it, it all started, you know, as a grad student. I was a grad student at Berkeley, and they have a deal uh, as a grad student uh, that if you write a paper and it gets accepted to a conference, uh, they send you there to present it. Yeah. <laughs> so actually in 1989, I had uh, three papers accepted, uh, one to a conference in uh, Tokyo, one a month later in uh, Nanjing, China, and one a month after that in Munich, Germany. And I convinced my advisor that it was cheaper to get a round the world in one direction ticket than three separate round trip tickets. Now, now wait a minute, Gina. Were, were you were you always a traveler prior to that? I mean, you, you, it sounds like you love travel, right? <laughs> well, before that trip, no. You know, before that trip, I, I had only been outside of the U.S. only once, you know, to China. But, you know, that was an eye opener for me. Um, and, you know, the fun thing background for you, you know, on me is that I'm actually the sixth, sixth generation academic. Mm. Uh, so my father was professor and his father and, you know, oh. down the line. And uh, we have a, a family heirloom, which is a, a wooden shoe that is uh, that was given by a monk to my great, 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 great grandfather, I guess. And behind on the underneath the shoe is inscribed a poem that basically says, you know, uh, traveling a thousand, you learn more traveling 10,000 miles than you do reading 10,000 books. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I yeah. guess it's deeply ingrained. It, you know, it's yeah. fate. But the point is, this trip that I made around the world, I ended up in, you know, it was pretty wild. You'd, I'd end up, I, I remember waking up one morning uh, on the beaches of Alexandria you know, where you had these women covered from head to toe, you know, on the beaches. And the next morning I was in uh, Antiparos, uh, where there were these naked Scandinavian women running around. And so, you know, just right. the different cultures around the world and, and, and just through these, you know, it, for me, it was quite fascinating seeing these different cultures where you have people growing up with completely different backgrounds. Yet, you know, when you talk to them and you make eye contact, you can uh, Establish a connection pretty easily, and so that led into this inquiry into you know what is the commonality of man, you know what mm -hmm. is it that allows us 
communicate and to kind of share experience and to commune and to bond and empathize and and this kind of thing. And then for me, I, I, ha I personally had an awakening experience in the early 90s, around 91, 92. And then, um, and then that changed everything for me. <laughs> what, what, what happened there? Um, things get kind of, things got kind of surreal. And, uh, you know, the typical, you probably hear the story a lot, but this, you know, lack of sleep and, and, you know, highly energized mind. And so you, you, we, we, we've studied it and I've got language to, to describe it a lot better, but you, you just kind of pop out of your mentally constructed worldview. And, uh, and and as you do that with a, a highly energized physiology, weird things start happening in terms of synchronicity, in terms of being able to communicate with people and, and this kind of. But at that time, for me, I wasn't able to sustain it. And so from that, what happened, our whole family, you know, since the early 90s have started doing Qigong. And so and which is really looking at energy and the physiology. And then my mother. Uh, who's based in Los Angeles, did uh, cancer research for about 20 years, from the 70s to the 90s, but and really looked at cancer and the causes of cancer and markers for cancer, et cetera. And then when we started doing Qigong, she actually shifted. And then now she teaches meditation and Qigong and, and kind mm. of personal processes. Uh, and, you know, if you want to look at the cause of cancer, <laughs> it's pretty clear that, you know, assuming that there is a mind body connection, uh, mental conflict leads to physiological conflict at some level. And um, and so we've kind of our whole family has been kind of on this path. And then for me, you know, as an academic, you know, I've been in digital entertainment for about 20 years. I have a Ph.D. Uh, from Berkeley in engineering taught at USC for a while. Um, and then really it's looking at. How, and for me, it, coming around, it's really looking at how does media influence worldview and physiology. So physically, you're sitting at your place in uh, how, in Nova Scotia, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sitting here at my place, you know, here in Hong Kong. But then the question, and I guess whoever's listening to this is sitting wherever they're located <laughs> listening to this. But then the question is, where is this conversation? So where is this right now, where you and I are talking? Okay, why is that a question? Was this mental space? Well, so where is this? So physically, I know, you know, physically my body is uh, in Hong Kong, and physically your body is at your yeah. place in, in Nova Scotia. But then the question is, where is this, okay. this conversation? And so... <laughs> where, <laughs> where is the conversation? Where is this conversation? Yeah. So... You know, we seem to be in the same space. So if I mention this common friend that we have, Chuck, and if I mention his beard or his lack of hair, you know what I mean, right? Chuck, Chuck Hilly, yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. or the books, you know, the first book that he wrote was called, you know, the first book that he wrote. Yeah. It, sorry, it broke up there. Yeah. Enlightenment for Beginners. Yeah. 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 So for me, you know, for me to say that and know that to prod that answer from you yeah. it seemed it's, it would appear that mentally we're in the same space. It's just like me pointing at the sofa in front of me and saying, do you see that sofa? And you yeah. saying, yes, if you were yeah. physically here. Um, but in this mental space now, I just made a reference to Chuck Hillig and his first book, which mm -hmm. is analogous to me pointing to something physically in this space. And you clearly see it and, and you're clearly able to, the same answer that I seem to have as well, too. So the question is, where's this mental space? And arguably, where we're at in this mental space is where you're at when you watch a movie, read a book, or play a video game. And, and so what's the implementation of this? So my background as an electrical engineer, you know, if you look at a computer, there's a relationship between the hardware and the software. So the question is, from a consciousness perspective, what is the relationship between the physical body and the mind? So if I mention Chuck Hillig, are there certain neurons in my brain that are wired like yours? In a ha what's the underlying physical implementation mm -hmm. of this ecological mental connection that we have? <laughs> where we're at right now in this conversation is where you're at when you read a, watch a movie or play a video game. And so then now the neat thing that we're doing from a research perspective is I can create experiences with video games that engage your mind. But then by looking at how you move, you know, what decisions that you make and how your physio 
allergy response, I can start mapping out what your worldview is. I can start mapping out the stimuli that trigger responses in your physiology. Mm -hmm. And once I know that, and we do this when we speak one on one, you can see people frown, you can see their facial expressions and, and you know, their body language tells you a lot if you know how to read it. And so there seems to be a relationship between the inner life of a person and their physiology. And so that's what we're looking at understanding. And we're trying to understand kind of the stories and the symbols that evoke behavior, <laughs> that provoke or evoke behavior. And, and look at that, that mapping. And so if you think about it, you know, so in the in the material world, in an analogy, using an analogy, in the material world, objects have mass and they have charge. There's the strong, weak uh, nuclear forces. There's electromagnetism and there's gravity. And based upon these things, we, we can predict how things move. But the question is, uh, what do we have in this mental space? So the, the, the hard problem of consciousness is understanding the relationship between the physical and, the, and this mental. But that's a really hard problem because I can't really prove that there's anything outside of my awareness. And, you know, that's, <laughs> that gets deep and philosophical and everything. But so let's, let's not try to solve that problem. But if we decouple it, like I mentioned, the material world, objects have mass and they have charge and we can predict how they move. The question is, what's in this mental space? In this mental space, memes, or is apple, orange, pear, etc., or car, Hong Kong, New York, Nova Scotia, all these are just memes. But the question is, what are the forces in this mental psychological space? And so, you know, I can talk to you very kindly and politely, or I can, you know, talk to you more forcefully and I can yell at you. And arguably, if I yelled at you, there'd be more force than if I talked to you. That would be like more forceful, arguably, mm -hmm. than if I just whispered or talked to you politely. And so the question, and we can perceive this, but what's what's the force motivating the action? And you know, so if you look at passion or desire or or these forces, ultimately they're going to map to the physiology, and yeah. usually they'll map to some emotion. And so for most people, they're acting from fear, need, or desire, mm -hmm. which come from a mental framing of the experience of the moment, rather than arguably underneath the mental cons mental reality is an underlying experience that's present within everyone. And the best way I can describe that with words is that uh, right here and right now, it's good to be alive. Mm. And so the question <laughs> is, how do we get people to connect to that and to use that force and work from that force mm. versus the conditioned forces that are driving them from their conditioned mind based upon their previous experiences and the conditioning that they've taken on from that? Yeah. I mean, it's Does that makes sense. It, it makes sense. It's beautiful, really. I mean, to boil it down, to, so it's good. It's good to be alive. Has tremendous yeah. implications. I mean, the implications are are endless and tremendously as profound as they can, as you could imagine. But the neat thing about that is that if you can feel into that, if you can really feel into that, there's like a vast amount of energy there. <laughs> yeah, it's um, the fact that that's what I'm saying right now. <laughs> It is, yeah. I just have to laugh. And, and so the thing is that if you can connect to that and there's nothing you really then have to do, then the question is if you can connect to that and then rather than using the stories to drive the action, use awareness. You know, just mm -hmm. look at the emergence of that which is arising and then act from the innate joy of being. That gives you a sensitivity as well, too. Mm -hmm. And so the question is can you connect to that and then work from that and then really literally see the life as it presents itself. Now, the challenge for that is the mind is going to want to make up stories and, oh, how am I going to pay rent? What am I going to do about this? Oh, that guy screwed Constantly. me last time, et cetera, et cetera. But that's just story in the mind. And so the definition of enlightenment that I have, which is very simple, is are you able to distinguish between what's coming physically from what's around you in this moment versus what's coming from the mind? So actually, everything that we're talking about right now is completely in the realm of the mind. And that's very different from the room that I'm sitting in right now and the smell and the light and, and the speakers that I have sitting in front of me. And you know, I'm in the music room here in the sofa, the feeling of the sofa that I'm sitting on. And <laughs> that's completely different. Yeah. And this ties back into physiology again, because sure. mind and body arguably come together in emotion. 
And we know the stimuli. So if you look at the autonomic nervous system and uh, all of these, the, the, of how the physiology reacts, you know, the physiology normally, you know, fear and anxiety and all these other things are de were developed from a developmental psychology perspective to keep you physically safe. But what happened was as we developed, we went from the brain stem to developing the, the uh the limbic system to developing the cortex, where a lot of the thought and ideas come from, is as we develop that, it uses the same hardware, you know, using the software hardware analogy again, it uses the same hardware. And so, you know, adrenaline, ATP, all these chemicals that get thrown into your bloodstream when you're in a fight or flight response happen when, you know, if I say, hey, someone's stealing your car right now, Jerry, you know, it's, it's the same physiological response, although nothing physically is threatening you right now. And so, but from the physiology's perspective, it doesn't know the difference. It doesn't know the difference between a psychological trigger and a, and a immediate physiological trigger happening in the moment physically. Yes, right. And so if you can bring yourself fully present for most people in the first world, right here and right now, everything's fine. And arguably the natural state for that is joy. And so, so then the mm -hmm. question is, what are the forces motivating action? And, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. yeah or, or, or what is action really? Yeah. Well, if you want to go to that level, you know, I'm, again, I'm just trying to explain things rationally here, but then, you know, where we come into this, which is quite fascinating is looking at story and the stories that we do have. And this is where studying people like Joseph Campbell and, understanding the hero's journey and, and looking at story, how story is implemented from a, in a neurophysiological perspective, and then really looking at archetypes and, and myth and, and Carl Jung and, you know, this kind of thing of looking at what are, is meaning and how is meaning in the mind connected to physiology and physiological. And this, this seems to bring up, again, you mentioned media as part of all this too. So now, now it seems exactly. like you're getting into media because how do we find out about all these things, and, Joseph Campbell and so on. And what we're trying to do is really look at, yeah, exactly. And then now with video games, the cool thing, if you look at traditional media, traditional media is mass media where you basically hit everybody with the same message. But now with the internet and, and, and interactive media that can personalize to, you know, I, I can look at how you respond and then personalize the message too. There are huge opportunities for that. And so the main goal that we're trying to work on for, uh, on the research side and what we're trying to promote around the world is really looking at how do you use media, interactive media and biofeedback to facilitate personal transformation and induce awakening. And uh, that's the that's the kick that I'm on right now. <laughs> and arguably, wow. if you can do that using digital technology, which is, you know, if you look at, you know, there's another argument I usually give is that. If you look at all the problems of the world today, all the problems to, of the world today are exponential. So if you look at pollution, deforestation, population growth, all these curves, they're all exponential. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of at the high end of the curve on the <laughs> exponential growth. But there's another curve that's exponential and that's Moore's law, computer performance doubling every 18 months. So the reason, the fact that you have a new computer and the computer 18 months from now will be twice as fast and our network bandwidth is getting faster, et cetera. I'm a big fan, you probably know of, uh, as you know from my email address, uh, Fusikoi, uh, of the ancient Greeks. And the ancient Greeks were very careful to distinguish between phusis, which are things that just kind of happen, emerge in emergence with nature, and technique, which have gone through the filter of the mind. And mm -hmm. arguably, all of the problems of the world come from acting from a conditioned mind versus kind of intuition or insight or, you know, a different kind of knowing. Yeah. And so the challenge that we have right now is how do we use this exponential technology? If you look at digital technology, it almost exclusively influences the mind and thought. And so how do mm -hmm. we use this technology to facilitate personal transformation? And if we can do this in an engineered way, Mikey Siegel came up with this term, uh, engineering enlightenment, that we like to use. Um, if we can do this, use this exponential technology to, to facilitate transformation, you know, on a way that scales globally, mm -hmm. the premise is that if you wake the whole world up, you have world peace. Yeah, it's kind of like, like riding Moore's Law with uh, this technology you're working on. Yeah, yeah. 
And uh -huh. so, so we're really looking, it's a very multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary, you know, approach uh, towards trying to facilitate these kind of, and then we're, right now, started in media, but, you know, with, with Bruce Damer recently, we started experimenting with psychedelics and, and have some really interesting results. And we have a really good theoretic framework as to how all of this kind of happens and works, uh, which is maybe beyond the scope of this, uh, this interview, but well, what, uh, what's, that's all. What, uh, what psychedelics are you working with? And uh, can you say a little bit about the um, nature of the studies? Uh, not too much, no. uh, mainly because they're illegal. <laughs> okay, all right. But uh, but Burning Man has been a great platform for doing experiments. Yeah. What What do you like about Burning Man? I'm sure there's a lot of things. What's the What are some of well, the uh, benefits? Well, mainly just a lot of the. I'm surprised. A lot of the really, I, I was surprised at the the caliber of the uh, scientists doing psychedelic work that are at Burning Man, yeah. and for us. Right now, you know, the short of it all is that your mental worldview, your belief system, you know, your conditioned mind, all it really does really is it just regulates the energy in your physiology. So like when you get into an argument or something like this or, or, or something good happens, you know, you feel very energized. But if you get bad news or, you know, depression and so manic depression and, and all of these other areas are just the inability to regulate the energy and the physiology because of some kind of conditioned worldview. Mm -hmm. So the way that they're experiencing the moment processed through their belief system is suppressing or, or, or over engaging certain aspects of their physiology in the production of energy or, or chi or prana or you know and this is this is something that we're, we're exploring. and what psychedelics especially things like lsd do is they they're like a, a nitrous hit they give you a, a burst of energy which normally will just push through your conditioned worldview but if you have like a guided thing going on where you've got someone that can bring you to a different state that's stable that's that's mm -hmm. stable and maintainable mm -hmm. um you know it can at least give you a trail towards getting to a space where later on when you come back down, you can rediscover that path. And the key thing about all of that and the challenge for teaching all of this is it's about getting out of the mind. The yeah. question is how do you get someone out of the mind when you're using, you know, even the language, everything that I'm talking about here is in the realm of the mind. And so how can you, <laughs> how can you communicate Get someone out of this because whenever I say something, you're, it's just going to be interpreted by your worldview and then you're going to, quote, get it, quote and unquote, and it's just going to be part of your worldview. And so the only thing that you have uh, to get you out of that, one thing is uh, the thing about interactive media is I can start inducing experiences, just like good art, you know, when you see something or hear something and really understanding the neurophysiology of what's going on there, you can potentially kick someone into a different space. Um, you know, mm. that's, that's one thing. Or really getting them to learn presence and, and start working with presence, which is just looking at the emergence of that which is. Because, mm -hmm. like, I don't know, I wasn't planning on doing an interview with you tonight. I don't think you were planning on interviewing me tonight. <laughs> but it's just no, not happening. No, no. So, arguably, from, from where we were three hours ago, this is, like, emergent. Yeah, I mean, something that really impresses me is that there's so many modules that you work with, so many things that you're working with. Um, and I just want to go back. I found it fascinating. You mentioned you, you teach the course on recovering uh, recovering creativity. creativity. Uh, yeah. And, and then the, the interview kind of, in a way, you can say it just um, describes some of the um, some of the tools and some of the angles to look at in order to do that. And the, it, yeah. so, so do you incorporate all these things uh, into that into that course of, of recovering uh, yeah. activity? Sounds like sounds yeah, like you yeah. And, and we come up with new and we come up with new ways of doing things as well too. So this thing that I'm touring right now, I'm pretty excited. This Europe tour that we're doing, and then I'm going to hit the United States uh, in April is uh, this entrepreneurship, innovation and self-discovery. And the tagline for it just between you and me is, uh, and I guess your community of people, it's uh, entrepreneurship as a spiritual path. So 
That's, is that risky to use that word spiritual? Or is that what people want on this particular tour? One of the things tour? that we were talking about is how do you get people outside of the mind? Well, in our community, well, um, if, you're, if you're talking to entrepreneurs that are type A people, that's the last thing, and they're, you know, it's woo-woo. And if you talk to scientists, you know, the term woo-woo comes up a lot and stuff. Yeah. But, uh, but the whole point behind it is traditional way of teaching. You had, you know, you have like the Gita, you have the Bible, you have, you know, you have books that tell you how to, that are rules of how to live, right? Yeah. And in there, you're dealing with a cultural, societal framework for how to act and how to find God or how to find yourself or, you know, what have you. And, you know, you have to interpret them based upon your belief system and your knowledge and, you know, it gets deeper and, you know, all this other stuff. But it's still kind of in the realm of the mind. Rather than that, especially for entrepreneurs, uh, whenever you have a passion, you know, when I mentioned emotion is a force, whenever you have a strong passion working through a conditioned worldview. So when somebody has something they really want to do and it's acting through their belief system and they're working with or against the unknown, you know, which is the material world, space and time, there's an opportunity for transformation. Mm. <laughs> so rather than giving somebody a belief system to adhere to and to live by, the question is, can you work with a person's existing belief system and help, and as they work through their belief system, cultivate transformation and, and facilitate awakening through that process? You know, you probably know there are certain things you try to do. Sometimes when you try to do something, it's fairly like you probably know, right now we're ha we're being interviewed and it I'm, we're doing this interview and it, it seems fairly effortless. I was like, you're like, hey, I'd like to interview. And I'm like, well, what about now? And you're like, what about 20 minutes? I'm like, okay. And so it seems like this is flowing fairly fluidly. But I'm I'm sure you have other people where you've tried to interview them and it's like, oh, we can't get the timing right. Oh, I missed. And then oh, we tried to interview and then the connection goes down and I don't know whatever things may happen happen fairly effortlessly okay. and then other things it's like no matter how hard i try <laughs> okay <laughs> well exactly so my point exactly and so there are other things no matter how hard you try it just doesn't work especially yeah. you probably know especially when you're dealing with relationships and everything or you know if i'm trying to raise money or i'm trying to build a market you know part of it is you just have to a large part of this if you talk to successful entrepreneurs or business people or or anyone that's relatively successful, uh, they end up, you know, you have to have innate talent or whatever, but it, a large part of it is being at the right place in the, at the right time. And so the question is, how do you do that? How do you do it? I mean, <laughs> is, there, is there a how to that at all? Or, or, is, or is it always the right place in the right time if, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if your well, uh, mind, mind is free? Well, yeah. Yeah, and, and so again, it's looking at what are the forces that are motivating the action and how the reality is responding. But most people will tie it into story. It's like, well, this happened because it's his fault or she did this or he did this. And oh, and then the mailman didn't deliver this at the right time. or And then we had a network glitch, which I don't know, whatever. But they'll tie it to story rather than really look at the emergence of that which is. Mm. And look at the dynamic between what within me is trying to do something and how is the reality responding the emergent of the emergence of that which is and uh how does that interact what did you just say the emergence of that which is and uh, which is and, and, and looking and, at how how one's uh, how one is responding to their what no, environment well how well, what the forces are motivating the action or the intention or whatever and how the reality responds and so it, and then really look at things first, you know, you can still look at things within the realm of story, but then really looking at things mythically almost in terms of what these symbols represent of what's going on, but then really looking at it from an emergent kind of a, <laughs> as an emergent phenomenon and looking at how things show up. Is this another way of saying of just seeing things as they really are? Well, there is. And, and this, this ties into, you know, I'm having some discussions right now and there's big differences we have uh, with some of the people in the non-dual community between this kind of integrated versus uh, dissociated form of kind of non-dual awareness, I suppose. Because, yeah. you know, 
put in layman's terms, you know, I, Joseph Campbell has a really nice quote that I like to use. And the question is, you know, are you the light bulb or are you the light? Right. Mm. So when you see a light, there's light and then there's the light bulb. And the light bulb usually metaphorically represents the, the, the body and who I think I am physically. And then the light is just consciousness that's enabling all of this. And so for most people, they identify with the light, light bulb. Um, but who you really are from a non-dual perspective is the light that is all of this, <laughs> literally. Uh -huh. so, so, the so, awareness of this. So the dissociation is a dissociation from, from realizing that you are the light? Well... Well, no, a lot of people realize that they are the light, but if you look at the way they behave and the way they respond, you know, and you guys go into it as well, too, of, you know, there's the absolute and the relative. I've heard some of your interviews where you say, yeah. well, you are the absolute, but you're dealing in the relative. And well, in the dealing with the relative, you have to deal with the relative and the mind and thought and all of this other stuff, yeah. or else how are you going to pay rent and all this other stuff, which from my perspective is kind of a, a dissociated form, if you don't mind me saying Versus an integrated thing is realizing, really, I don't know what the fuck or what the hell <laughs> any of this is, <laughs> but it's all just kind of happening. And, you know, it's really keeping with the uh, the inquiry and, you know, wow, how is this? What is this? But well, knowing that right here and right now, good to be alive and things are yeah. just kind of happening and things show up and, and you just kind of flow with it. If yeah, you well, I mean, I, don't, and, I, I think that's kind of known. Maybe in an unspoken way, but I mean, if you come from that place, there's not much to say. So, if every yeah, but then if you look at behavior, if you look at behavior, though, a lot of people, and and th this ties into what we know about how the physiology works. And the way I explain a lot of this stuff to lay people generally is a peak performance. Yeah. So if you look at jazz musicians or athletes, you know, Olympic, you know, world class caliber athletes. Or, or stock traders or anyone that does anything, you know, where they're just in the zone, if you will, you know, from a Csikszentmihalyi, uh, Csikszent you know, the, the flow guy, uh, and, and, and really look at peak performance. It's, and if you look at the, the interpretations of the, the descriptions that people have of that state, well, time seems to stop. I feel connected to everything, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so people are able to reach that. But it's context sensitive. It, it depends on what they're doing at that moment. So when I'm doing my sports on the field, I feel that way. But then when I'm home riding my bike or dealing with my kids, you know, or doing my taxes, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in a different mindset. And physiologically, the energy in the physiology will will regulate. And the physiology from a from a survival instinct perspective we want to keep in low energy state because in the early days, finding food and expending energy was was expensive. <laughs> and so physiology naturally wanted to, you know, bears hibernate, you know, people thought is a, a short form of expending energy or, or per preserving energy, right? So, oh, I know that I don't have to think about it anymore. I don't even have to be aware of it. And so if you look at how we regulate our intention, it's really a conservation of energy. Um, but the thing is that if you can connect to, you know, bliss or the right here, right now, it's good to be alive experience. So the question is, can you push a lot of energy through the physiology uh, independent of context? And so even for now, you, I'm kind of talking fairly quickly and we're covering a lot of very, you know, well, you know, these topics. So but anyone that doesn't know these topics will spend a lot of time trying to catch up or figure out what we're trying to say, et cetera. And, you know, just to be in a, a, a lively discussion and keeping track of a lively discussion requires a lot of energy. And perhaps also, if you're really aware of what's going around and the subtle things that are going around, you know, in the physiology and the experience of the moment, physically, uh, that requires a lot of energy as well, too. And so part of what we're looking at is normally, you know, thought is the training wheels for <laughs> for being. And so can you use the ideas that drive you to kick the, phys the the energy of the physiology up? And hopefully, you know, with these awakening experiences, et cetera, can you reach escape velocity where you can let go of mental constructed worldview and land somewhere which doesn't require a belief system wow. and resting, resting and not knowing. And that's that that's what we're looking at as enlightenment and yeah. if you can do that and live from that then you know arguments and all this other stuff 
you know, if the physical world and space and time is an illusion, this mental world that we're in right now is an illusion of the illusion. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the question right. from a force is in the realm of the mind perspective, from where does conflict arise? The only time conflict is going to arise, you know, if you said, you know, fuck you, Gino, you're full of shit. And I said, hey, Jerry, you're right. I am full of shit. You know, how do I improve myself? There's no conflict. And so the question mm -hmm. is, where does conflict arise? And the only time conflict is going to arise when there's an emotional attachment on one side bumping up against an emotional attachment on the other side. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm able to let go of all mental worldview, <laughs> you know, which is yeah. arguably the awakened state, why would I ever have an argument? <laughs> right. Because yeah. I can let anything in this mental belief thing because I know it's an illusion of this illusion. Yeah, yeah, right? it's, it's true. Right. You know, if, if you have an argument, it might just be for the enjoyment of the uh, argument. Yeah, but then you wouldn't generally you would take it seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it wouldn't be a uh, hostile argument, although it could be. I mean, if you're into, you know, physical fighting, for example, uh, as a sport, then, you know, there can be quite a, you know, grappling going on. I mean, but arguably, literally. The force drive, but arguably the force driving that is going to be some fear, need or desire. So what we're looking at is we're looking at objective measures. So, you know, given what we know about the mind and the body, can we look at objective measures for enlightenment? And so this is something that, you know, Jeffrey's been doing a lot of empirical studies, you know, traveling around the world, interviewing people, me too. And, you know, we're really inquiring into this. And Jeffrey's been traveling around interviewing people. And then yeah. we're looking at, at, at building a theoretic framework, so yeah. that, which is actionable, testable. That's where people, you know, this, the discussions that you've been having with Guru Dada, and I'm seeing him in Berlin, and other people that are showing up related to this, uh, you know, we're, we're really looking at, again, if you're trying to engineer this kind of thing, it's looking at the, the physiological state uh, of it, whether it be brainwave or, you know, connection of some sort. And, and we're getting pretty good at identifying people, especially in, in the discussion. The big difference that I have with Jeffrey is this notion of an integrated thing where people can just let go of any mentally constructed worldview. Arguably, anyone that's awake should be able to do that. Versus this dissociated form where I say, yes, I am the underlying awareness of all of this, but, you know, I'm still going to, you know, do whatever I, I do, uh, you know, from a conditioned mind. And so there's the awareness that, you know, a surrender to that which is, arguably, where I'll just continue with my conditioned behavior. But arguably, you know, if you can do this with some kind of sense of agency, if you will, which is debatable, and we can get into that debate <laughs> in a very deep way of uh, being able to, 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 to take that knowing of I am just the awareness of all of this and, and understand the emotions that drive the stories um, and, and being able to let go of all stories. Mm. And so that's yeah. arguably the integrated version. Yeah, you know, maybe you should go more into the uh, dissociation and integration because that's a big part of uh, of what you're into. Well, arguably, well, arguably, you know, I think what the discussions, my interpretation of the discussions that you had with the, this Guru Dada guy, he's trying to whack, you know, he's looking for this notion of absolute or, you know, if you were really awakened, then, you know, this is what would happen. So he, I think, I think at least if you look at what he seems to be saying is looking at a certain kind of behavior or a certain kind of characteristics, which is what we're looking at. We're rather than behavioral things or how people would talk, which is kind of what he's doing based upon his perception of things. We're looking at objective measures that may be yeah. physiological or brain states and looking at kind of default mode network. If you look at Zoran Josipovich or, you know, a lot of the work that's been on the neurosciences side that's looking in this space. And we're doing a conference related to this in Taiwan uh, in January. Bringing scientists yeah. and people that are in a, in a, Jeffrey uses the term uh, persistent non-symbolic states of uh, consciousness. And how do you feel that will be attended that conference in Taiwan? How much interest is Pretty there? Pretty good. I, is I'm, there... I'm funded by the uh, well, I'm funded by the uh, the top Buddhist Zen master in Taiwan, and then I've got people from the government supporting it at the minister level. And then we've got, uh, you know, that's kind of building. And then I'm, I'm going around the world finding people, uh, you know, both on the science, science, credible scientist side, 
Mm-hmm. And then also on the uh, kind of in a persistent non-dual state side, you know, to, to, to really, because I think personally, and this ties into, you know, I'll go into story. I actually, <laughs> I turned 50 this year and I have four mm-hmm. young kids. And, you know, if you're going to try to do one thing, you know, as a, as a, fa- as a professor at a university, which this is all story, but uh, I only have 10, 10 or 15 years at most of professional work left. And so if you're going to try to solve one problem, you know, what problem are you going to try to solve? And uh, this is the problem that that I'm looking at. And arguably, if we do this and achieve world peace, you know, that would be great. (laughs) Although everything is as it be in this moment. But, you know, this is just the journey that I'm on. And the reality seems to be supporting the effort at the moment. So I just keep playing along. Well, I mean, people um, access media. People, uh, all live, living people have physiologies to deal with. All living yeah. people have mental states. We, we, we have our own life energy. And uh, so it sounds like all you're doing is putting it all together so that people can uh, live from an awakened state instead of from Or the, get to that state, arguably. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, who's doing all of this anyways? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, you probably, if, if you, yeah, I mean, how do you feel about it? Who's doing, who's doing what you do, what you apparently do? Well, I have I'll, no idea. I'll I just keep bumping into people. Well, yeah. I have no idea. I, I keep bumping into people and, uh, and things seem to just be flowing along. Um, but we're trying to, you know, from a, we're trying to build community and, and just raise more awareness in this space. And, you know, the, the reason I brought that whole story in is because I can, Really, personally, and this is maybe an ego side or whatever, but I can think of no more worthwhile endeavor uh, at this point in time. Right. I mean, I, I've, I've, you know, I've, I feel that I'm pursuing the same thing in my own way and, um, and have been. The question is, how do we come together now and, and, and identify the people who's doing what and, and, and try to really work towards engineering this? We could come together more. Definitely. I mean, I know I have my community and the communities within it. Yeah. And I don't know, I got an email from someone saying, I mean, there's a, when I started out, there was one non-duality discussion group. And then now I don't know how many there are on Facebook alone. Yeah. There must be scores of them. And and someone wrote me and said they weren't, weren't being treated well on a certain non-dual discussion group. And it made me think yeah, it would kind of be nice to bring all these groups together in some way to everyone to be able to communicate together. So there's a certain certain amount of unity needed. Well, the challenge for this too, is that we're, and that's the hard thing, you know, tied into what we're trying to do on the discernment side is that again, how do you, you know, you, you could, it could be like a fan club kind of thing, but, but we're really looking for, you know, if you're trying to study this objectively, scientifically as well too, it's really, you know, who are the specimens and and the challenge for communicating all of this is it's all inner experience. So you really can't, you know, for you, even with your Guru Dada discussions, it's like, you know, where's I think I know where this guy's coming from, but you know, you know, there's all this projection and all this other stuff. But then, you know, how do you ident- identify people? And then can we get like people that are really quote know what they're talking about <laughs> unquote and can communicate it in rational kind of objective, you know, means. And, you know, building that community is uh, that community is fairly small right now, but there's yeah. a lot of interest, just like, you know, just like there are tons of Christians. But, you know, how many people are really, really, really living it? But uh, and, and again, it's just trying to take, you know, what, what I my experience and, you know, what I know of academia and entrepreneurship and, and really trying to cast it in, in, in other ways, you know, at Deepak Chopra's conference. A couple of years ago, I gave a talk, you know, it was on, uh, can your baby be your guru? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, I still think sure. it's a valid path towards world peace. If you look at a lot of the people that, that are violent and all this other stuff, they've had trauma at, in youth. And if you look at developmental psychology and Piaget and, and especially the Wilhelm Reich stuff and how the emotion state develops and everything, if we can do enlightened parenting and, I mean, and raise kids that are... <laughs> more aware and and not tied not so tied to this mental worldview and kicked into fear and everything that would do it as well too we could do this in two generations uh, uh, you know you bring up you bring up the topic of parenting whenever i talk to people who have kids 
I want to ask them, you know, how, how's, uh, how's your parenting uh, influenced by your um, experience, your knowledge, your work, your interests, your passion? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's yeah. learning. And, and then for me, the core for this, again, if you look at this from a, from a Greek philosophy perspective, it's really looking at natural intelligence or phusis. And arguably, when we're born, we're very aware and uh, arguably there's no mind. <laughs> There's conditioned uh -huh. behavior, you know, but uh, there's, you know, the natural intelligence is fairly strong in that. Yeah, yeah like but you then said, as yeah. the mind develops, yeah. you know, conditioning gets taken on. Uh, and then again, it's really looking at the dynamics of experience and how experience is codified in the physiology. So you have to be aware Does that make sense? of, uh, well, it sounds to me like you have to be very aware of what's happening with your kids and, uh, and kind of... Uh, allow them to naturally unfold. I don't know. I'm, putting, I'm probably putting words in your mouth. Well, yeah. And then, and then also learn from them. And so the, the theme was uh, the topic, you know, the talk that I gave was, uh, can your baby be your guru? Yeah. And so if you look at these people looking for these no mind Zen masters and all this other stuff, you know, no mind yeah. acting from presence and natural intelligence, you know, that's a newborn baby right there. Yeah, it's pure natural and intelligence. And as, as, as it develops, it's codifying, you know, it's creating a mentally constructed worldview. And so, so the question is, can we have developed children, babies, so that they can communicate from an experiential knowing? And then the question from the parent side is, can I, through the act of parenting, rediscover the wonder of life? How do you feel your kids? So me, yeah. Well, I, I just, they're all works in progress and stuff, but yeah. and then, you know, it's me and my, my wife, <laughs> mm -hmm. which, which, and, you know, we can go through the whole surrendering to another and versus, sur and uh, this is a, another conversation, but, but the question from a, a, a path towards awakening, arguably, is can you surrender to another person? You know, so in the intersubjective of one person and another, can you let go of your mental worldview? And literally surrender to another person, you know, through deep empathy, et cetera. And then if you can do that, uh, and arguably another person is conscious and can communicate in language that you can comprehend, then the, uh, the, the question is, can you then kick the energy up even higher into surrender to that which is? So mm -hmm. as reality plays out and emerges and things happen, it has a certain, you know, I don't want to get too new agey on it, but frequency or you know, there's certain things that just kind of happen that seem to appear in a pattern kind of way. And then can you kick the energy up to be sensitive and aware and, and responsive to that which is emerging? And that's a, that takes a lot more energy and it's a lot more subtle. When you talk about kicking up the energy and earlier you mentioned Qigong, uh, is that a method for doing that? Or do you have anything else more specific to say about kicking up energy? Well... Qigong, and, and, and so the interesting thing about this, which, which is a good way of getting people into this, what I usually do, because ultimately language is used to communicate experience. And if, I've ha if, if I'm using language and we don't have a common semantic reference, then no, no amount of talking is ever gonna work. And so the trick is to find the language, which, or the context, which kicks people up into like the zone, if you will. And so for many people, it's, whether it's running or biking or sports or playing music or whatever, you just use that context. And then, but what you try to do then is you try to, from that, make them realize that the energy and the physiology relates to how their body physically feels, how they're breathing, you know, where the stress is and all of this other stuff. And so if you say, well, wherever you're at with that, rather than being aware of what's around you be aware of how you're breathing and cultivate somatic awareness of just being aware of how your physiology is uh when you're doing whatever gets you there and then the question is can you maintain that in your physiology you know sounds like decoupled from context yeah well, you sort of re referred to that earlier talked about that earlier and uh then you talked about the objective measures for enlightenment yeah. and um, so this sounds like ongoing practice then you know can you maintain that level that you've kicked up to um, you know independently of uh, 
of the, of a, a context in which in which you might typically find yourself in the zone, you know, independent of that. Yeah, and and the psychology, it, because it wants to conserve energy, will naturally go to a lower energy state, right? Mm -hmm. And then we will make up story to 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 to, and, and story is what regulates the energy and the physiology. It's it's really great. There's a guy named Dan Siegel in Los Angeles that came up with a really good definition of mind, which is the, the regulation of information and energy. You know, so mm -hmm. if you think of what the mind really does, it just regulates the, uh, the information where we're at in this mental space you know, and the energy and the physiology. And mind equals story. So. Well, mind equals <laughs> whatever uh, the potential is. And so here, this is quite interesting. And, and, you know, this ties into this natural growth of this stuff and why I, I find uh, manic depressives so fascinating um, is because manic depressives have had the mania side. They know a heightened uh, high energy state because they've been there and they know the surreal things that can happen in that state. But the issue is they just can't maintain it in the physiology. Now, if you look at most people. The physiology, A, it wants to conserve energy, but the physiology also craves the high energy state. And so the reason why people drive cars, fast cars, do drugs, have crazy sex, you know, whatever rocks their boat, it's because they're they really like to be on the edge where the adrenaline is, is kicking and they're in a high energy state. You know, mm -hmm. why jump out of a perfectly fine airplane, right? You know, hey, there's a feeling of oneness and all this other stuff. So so there's a natural tendency for the physiology to go to a high energy state. And so arguably, if you look at a baby, from being a baby to becoming Ariana Huffington, for example, you know, you're going from a low energy and through the trials and tribulations and experiences of life, you're, 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 you're aligning the physiology to generate more energy and to, 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 to you know, to do what you do. And align with that which is arguably. Just want to go back. Does that make sense? You said, uh, yeah, yeah. In my way of understanding it, I mean, I, I think people people understand the terms that are being used and the concepts you know, of energy and in, energy action, lack of energy, and these are things everyone under, yeah. we all we, we understand. Um, yeah. so, and so the goal here really is to also put it into use the language to put it into terms that that are accessible, and to use tools that are accessible. Well, the tools what, what thing is more challenging because people are locked into behavior patterns, right? And especially people that are driven by a mind. So, you know, generally, if you ask people to change their behavior, it's going to be, you know, what's the benefit? Just like a body in motion tends to stay in motion, a, a behavior pattern will try to maintain that behavior pattern, which reinforces the homeostasis of the physiology. When I mentioned tools, I thought of your uh, digital work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there it's it's again it's it's trying to understand that that mind body relationship and trying to personalize experiences and and try to get them. And you know, actually, Jeffrey and I wrote a paper on on using video games uh, for transformation, and we tried to identify the different ways in which video games can be used, you know, to to facilitate that. How much of your work is involved with that video? Uh, well, description of your um, of your job basically is is in digital media. Yeah, yeah. So we have a lab here, and I have a, a PhD student working in this space right now. He just passed his uh, he just passed his uh, what do they call it the uh, confirmation exam, and uh, and there yeah. he's looking at the bio the biometric measures for emotional states uh, using video games. Um, and then and then there we're looking at things uh, and he's also which is really wonderful too is he's uh, taking kind of the Claire Graves approach of looking at transformation as well too. So mm -hmm. if I can figure out where a person is and I know where they're going, how do I use how do I create situations that help facilitate transformation? Are the um... that's the kick. And then and then I've got I've, I've gotten about a million US so far under management right now. Uh, on the robotics and AI side. And that's a really fun thing right now, too. What we're doing is, emo you know, uh, robo robots are, are very emotive, can be very emot emotively expressive. And so 
So you can engage people emotionally, arguably. And so we're looking at low cost toys that also have a, a wireless uh, to the cloud. So actually it can have toys all around the world with people interacting with toys and all the computation in the AI is done in the cloud and all the responses and interactions uh, are processed in the cloud too. And I can actually start building models of how different people at different ages and different cultures uh, engage and, and interpret and, 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 <laughs> and behave in relation to certain stimuli. And we're working towards that. And the economic uh, impact of that for game company companies that make games could be tremendous. I guess that's uh, is that well, a funding you uh... challenging right now because and a lot there's a lot of interest. You know, uh, I think two years ago I spoke at the Cannes Lion Festival. So advertising and and you know if you look at media and traditional mass media, and it, it's all about enslaving you. It's all about kicking you out of your being and then using that displaced energy to get you to buy something you don't need. Mm, wow. <laughs> That's the advertising industry today. Wow. And if you look at our understanding of video games, if you understand this mind-body relationship that I, I talk, was talking about, all video games really do is they just throttle your autonomic nervous system, right? Mm -hmm. So they, you know, the fear, the anxiety, so you're basically messing with the autonomic nervous system and dopamine, you know, the reward system in the body. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's, if, if you look at video games in that way, it, that, in that way, it's just using the natural processes in your body, in your physiology to kick all of these hormones into your bloodstream to give you an experience. So it's like doing yeah. drugs yeah. and people get addicted to that. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, sure. again, for most, most game companies, they want to get you addicted so that you'll keep paying them. So yeah. there's very little difference between kind of the media and, and the pharmaceutical industries. Can I, uh, interesting, fascinating. Can I ask, uh, is, it, is it public information who's funding the, uh, this uh, game development? Uh... Well, the fun stuff that we're doing here in Hong Kong, a large part of it is funded by the Innovation Technology Fund. And uh, mm -hmm. some of the fun things about being a, an academic is uh, for every dollar I get from industry, you know, if I can get industry to like it, I can get nine dollars from the government. Wow! So, so you have some industry interests. Yeah, 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 yeah. And right now, we're really trying to build a community of. We're trying to build a community around the world of researchers. We're trying to identify truly awakened people. Uh, Jeffrey's been doing a lot of that work and understanding that process. Um, we're we're looking at uh, building res a research community. You know, practical, published you know, credible scientists that are working in this space. And we're looking for uh, entrepreneurs because once you create and come up with the results, there are a lot of opportunities for products and services. If you look at the Consumer Electronics Show going on right now, there's a lot of watches that will look at your sleep patterns and, mm. you know, track your behavior and monitor all of this. So there's a lot of commercial opportunity for this. And we're looking for people that are sincerely interested in, in funding this kind of work as well too. And that's stuff that we haven't, we've only just started exploring and tapping. Um, but I, again, you know, just like they say, this is more from a spiritual practice thing, but you know, when the student is ready, the, the, <laughs> the yeah. teacher will appear. I figure, you know, when the, when the project's ready, the funding will appear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's a lot of money out there, and so it just has to be channeled into what you're doing. Well, like you say, it, it'll, your work and the money f find each other. Yeah, um, yeah. So, but or, so, or and then recognizing. But again, the challenge is, you know, a lot of people are coming from different worldviews and, and opinions, and especially in this area, and, you know, the, the whole, you know, touching different parts of the elephant, mm. you know, what is all of this, and can we come up with a, like a, a theoretic framework or an objective way of studying this or even a viable approach, you know, towards this? You know, I've spent the last... 15, 20 years trying to figure out, and I'm just sharing with you, you know, the some of the the findings that we've had and the approaches that we have and the understandings that we have. But you know, there are a lot of different belief systems out there, and there are a lot of people trying to do this, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> or work in this space in their own kind of way. And so, uh, but we're really, again, 
if you're going to do something in this life, why not does, this? Yeah, does that give you a lot of hope, knowing that there's not just you and your group, but the other groups? Well, uh, you know, and this is the subtle thing, because there, there's this hope assumes that there's a, there's something that, that, that needs saving. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, if you look at the news and the media and the stories, then, you know, if you try to breathe the air in China or, you know, look in Africa or, you know, there are all these stories of, of things that clearly, from a story perspective, need saving. But, you know, you from a wisdom tradition perspective and, you know, it's fun because you guys quote, I'll just throw this in here because you guys use the Gita or the Upanishads or whatever sutras. You know, for me, the thing that captures everything is uh, if you ever read the text to uh, the spiritual, the only spiritual text that I use in reference is uh, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the last line for that is everything under the sun is in tune. Is in everything is as it should be, yeah. but the sun is eclipsed by the moon. <laughs> and mm. in the previous song uh, called "Brain Damage," they say if the dam breaks open, you know, yeah, every day the paper boy brings more. And if the dam breaks open, many two years to see, I'll see you on the dark side of the moon. And in the first song, uh, "Breathe," they equate the sun to the unity consciousness. Mm. And so that which is not accepting what this is is the conditioned mind. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. it's like, well, why are you doing what you're doing? And I'm very serious and I can rationally explain it. But to be honest, I have no idea what any of this is. <laughs> yeah. What, would, you even, would you even say that you're doing it or, or, that it's be, or, that, or that it's being done? Or <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but play is an important thing and this is where video games come in is can you learn to live from joy which arguably is play and then one of the mottos i have in my lab is uh if you're not having fun you're not working yeah I and mean, that's the place to come from yeah <laughs> pursue pursue your follow your fun for follow your bliss follow Take your bliss your heart your fun your enthusiasm i'll just get you you know, where we're at in the cutting edge of this is that uh, really looking at the emergence of nature, of how things happen, becomes really quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And so what we're discovering, you know, from a highly energized, you know, going all in kind of thing, getting back to entrepreneurs and everything, is that the higher the energy you can generate, it seems like the more synchronicity, or maybe you're just more aware because you have more energy to, to, to be present and aware, but synchronicities, coincidences, and all these other things just kind of happen. Um, mm -hmm. And so really looking at how does nature unfold in relation to the level of consciousness becomes really quite, quite interesting, yeah. especially when you're talking about people at different levels of consciousness or even at high levels of consciousness working in collaboration. And so how does the reality respond or react to that kind of a thing? And that becomes really, really interesting. And what does it mean to be at a high energy? I mean, what, what's happening when you're at a high energy that creates, uh, I don't know if they're creating coincidences or if you're just, no, like you said, just noticing them. But what kind of, it seems like well, co clearly, co connections are being created, it seems like. Is that, well, does that make well, sense? Or? Well, well, and then clearly, and, and you know, this gets surreal and I, I, I'll just kind of stop at the, the limit here and I won't go into the surreal parts. but generally clearly if i'm more awake and alive and more energized i'm going to be more aware and more sensitive to that which is around me versus if i'm really dead tired or low energy yeah like you were even mentioning when we went for pie i was kind of low energy or whatever then clearly you know you're just going to be operating you know in a different in a different way versus being more present or or being more alert or being more energized and so you have a, there's a sensitivity factor there. So if I'm more alert and more aware, I'm going to be noticing a lot more things than a lower, low, yeah, a person at a lower energy state. Yeah, anyone, and anyone, gonna, anyone can know that through their yeah. own experience. Yeah. Some, some degree. And so the that. idea is to take that into, uh, into the metaphysical realm. And so that's where luck happens. 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. And then, and then other things that 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 are just, you know. And the fun thing about this is, you know, most people are working in survival mode. But you know, once you've gotten past survival mode, there are kind of four end games. And this is something that I've been meaning to write about. And it all depends on whether you believe there's a me, it's a me or a we. So is it? And this is kind of like a kind of like the uh, the Ken Wilber kind of integral stuff. There's either a me or a we, or in an in inner versus outer. So if I'm an outer, just me, then it's about money, sex, power, trying to live forever, some of these transhumanist kind of things. And you know, that kind of worldview is going to motivate predict that kind of behavior. Hmm. If it's a if it's a material is the reality and a we then you have some of these other transhumanists that are looking at you know going doing the star trek fantasy of going to other planets or philanthropy of helping education or ending malaria you know this kind of thing so this is a material we and the mm -hmm. inner me so this it's only me and the inner is the reality versus the material world generally these kind of people that i've encountered what they're working towards is becoming you know for lack of better term a body of light mm -hmm. and so if you look at a lot of these theater traditions in india etc you talk to these people oh, so i'm working to become a body of light and not everyone can do it it's like sperm you know one out of 300 million and you know i'm going to do it and i'm going to i'm, I'm going to achieve this body of light thing and there are places in india where you've got mounds where people have learned this death yoga or something and can leave their body and they basically have like one last party, get buried, and then just kind of leave. Hmm. So that's the inner is the reality, me. And then the inner reality, inner is the reality, we are people like me, arguably, and I put myself in that camp, which are working on collective awakening. Mm -hmm. And then arguably, just like as things scale, we went from single cell to multi cell, and, and you know, there's this whole axial age, you know, this. Uh, 500 BC to 200 AD period where all these teachers came. And so you've got a couple people awaken and now, you know, more and more people. And, you know, once you get critical mass or the whole planet, then, you know, we have that 2001 thing happen. Hmm. <laughs> or the Everything. Pierre de Chardin, you know, Teilhard de Chardin, this, this Omega point. Yeah. Everything. So the singular switches. people are, well, I don't know what happens, but uh, yeah. you have this, uh, you have some people like Ray Kurzweil pushing for transhumanist and this whole exponential technology thing where you can live. And that's a hardcore materialist perspective. And so there are people like Max Moore where they, they freeze your head and science will somehow re rebuild your consciousness from your frozen brain and mm. they'll rebuild the robot for you. And, you know, there's the hard, there are people living that, that world right now where there are hardcore yeah. materialists. And then there are people like I think you and me and us where we're we're working on this collective awakening thing, looking at this omega point thing where you know, everyone wakes up and I don't know I don't know what happens. Uh. I don't know. I don't know. We're, we're, we're not going to know. But arguably those are those are the quadrants. So you know once you have people that have kind of gone through the the physiological needs, the safety needs, the esteem, the belonging and esteem, you know, these are the Maslow pyramid thing. You know, once people have, have, I, I don't need to work, you know, I, you know, I'm making enough money, I'm happy, et cetera. You know, what am I going to do generally based upon wherever their worldview is from my experience, just empirical experience interviewing people, they seem to fall into these four categories. Hmm. Well, but, I hope, um, you know, like you're saying, you know, this tour thing, you know, that's that's pretty fun and exciting. And if we can, you know, sift through the network that you've put, you spent, you know, 10, 15 years putting together. And if we can really kind of identify people and, you know, bring these people together with the scientific community and then also look across other traditions as well too, the Christian or the Ju mm. Jewish or, you know, all these other Sufis and, you know, all these other traditions. Yeah. Um, it's pretty exciting, you know, to, to go around and, and to, to be able to, to start trying to build communities, you know, that are really inquiring. Yeah. I mean, it's exciting. Be a lot of fun. Yeah. I'm really looking for, yeah, you know, we I just started, the... I invited you to Europe. It's, I know it's too short notice, but I'm planning on doing that trip and, and, you know, this U S stuff every year. And then, there are the fun experiments that we're planning for Burning Man as well, too. 
uh, that I can't really say too much about. But uh, <laughs> how do you, how do you uh, how long do you stay in Burning Man? Like a few days, and how do you? Uh, what? Well, what, I, I what, went what are your camping time, facilities uh, there? Well, I was lucky. Um, I, I met some people that 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 were camped. I've been. I was asked by one of the big groups there to curate a speaker series, um, which is kind of exciting. Um, and then, you know, I didn't really think of. I wasn't really planning on going back, actually. But you know, if you're interested in doing work in transformation and and uh, you know, from a personal understanding perspective, uh, and and to potentially do some experiments, you know, related to substances that normally wouldn't be available or accessible in communities of people that right. wouldn't find these substances uh, accessible or, or practical. Um, right. That's like the perfect place. I mean, you can't design yeah. a better place. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, I don't, I, generally, I don't partake myself, but just in terms of trying to come up with, again, engineering experiences to facilitate transformation and induce awakening. You know, I've always stayed just in the media realm because I, I'm a firm believer that it has to be integrated. But then after talking to a lot of my friends, like like Bruce Damer, who have done you know ayahuasca journeys and this kind of a thing, but and then really looking at it from a neurophysiological perceptual experience kind of thing, and if you can engineer something and use that boost of energy to lay the trail work or lay the groundwork for uh, for uh, uh, higher stable higher states of consciousness, that's that's really really interesting. And, that's that's, uh, that's that's really your, and that's your work. So. Well, that's it's interesting, you know. It's, like... it's it's normally it's 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 not scalable the way mass media or interactive media and the the internet is, um, and you know culturally it's it's still very taboo and everything. Mm -hmm. But from a uh, if you're trying to build a theoretic framework and kind of have an under a rough understanding of what's going on and what can be done, uh, you know, it's <laughs> it's a tool. <laughs> and again, it's yeah. controversial. Not everyone, you know, is uh, is is. Uh, of that. Kind of, well, yeah, uh, yeah. Any any alt, so-called altered state of consciousness it will always be controversial. Appear, it's that, to and you know, there's all the Stan, there's all the Stan Groff stuff, and and for me, the other area of tremendous interest, and this is a tragedy. If, if I don't mind using your platform to just get this across, is uh, there's another guy. Um, I think I hooked you up with him. Is uh, he's at the site uh, Sean Sean Blackwell. He's out in uh, San Paulo, Sao Paulo. Uh, and he's got this website called uh, Bipolar or Waking Up. And I think what's happening in society today, if you look at, if you treat the mind or the brain almost as a, in a level of consciousness, almost as a CPU state, uh, you know, the analogous equivalent to a, a, a CPU processor in a computer, then a bipolar people that are manic depressive are really a tragedy because you've got a lot of people that are having like awakening experiences, but they just don't know what's going on. And the culture, their families and society and their culture doesn't know what's going on with them too. And they're basically put on meds and they're institutionalized and they, you know, what should be a profound experience turns into this negative, you know, bad, mm -hmm. horrible, you know, and, and, and so, so they're the low hanging fruit in, in, in my book, really? mainly because if you've never had an awakening experience, no matter how hard I try to communicate it to you in language, you're not really going to get what I mean, right? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> you've never had a direct experience yourself. But at least for these manic depressives, they've had like some kind of manic experience. So mm -hmm. they kind of you know, when you start talking about this, like, oh, yeah, I know, you know, this, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But the issue is that their, their beliefs, they're not able to shed or, or, or discard their belief system, almost like stages of a rocket. They can't let that booster stage go. And, uh, and so it's just giving them practices to, to, to try to stabilize that. Um, but right now, it's just they're being institutionalized. They're, it, it's, just, it's just sad. It's, it's, it's tragic. But if we can come up with, this, and, and so this is some of the experiments that we did at, at Burning Man, where we took people that were manic depressive and, and kind of gave them some practices and then got them off meds. And, and the fun thing about it is that, and the, the interesting thing in terms of just empirical observation, 
is that when you have a person manic, their brain is just spinning really fast mm -hmm. and it's disconnected from their, it's not integrated into their physiology. But when you get like a normal person talking to a manic person, mm -hmm. it's like, it's like a fast CPU talking to a slow CPU. It's just going to think and dance. It's just predicting everything that the slow CPU arguably is going to do. <laughs> and it's very difficult for them to communicate. But the thing is that if you can get someone arguably that, that, is awake and, and, and can, can rev themselves up, go to a higher energy state, you can actually match them energetically and then talk them down and then just go, well, focus on your breathing, you know, mm -hmm. and just stay with presence and then just get them back in their body. And then once they can get a couple of nights sleep, you know, they, they should be able to, to integrate a lot better uh, versus mm -hmm. becoming dependent upon meds. And so, you know, trying to find new methods of really treating these psychiatric disorders is another huge potential opportunity for the work that we're trying to do in relation to understanding the physiological, emotional uh, thing in bindings to the psychological stuff that's going in the realm of the mind. And to try to build communities and try to build new practices where you can if you have, imagine awaken, uh, like a community of awakened people and, and people that are having kind of bipolar issues to be able to ground these people and then use these people as, uh, for, for scientific study or, or, or just inquiry, uh, I mean, that would be like huge. Yeah, yeah, I just had this, yeah. vis this vision that might match your vision a little of a community, of a, of a global a world com community and uh, – and, and consisting of professionals who who are uh, also committed to this uh, collective awakening, yeah. and and now now you open the door of psychiatry, you know, yet another huge arm of your of your work. It's it really ties in with everything. Yeah. Well. Well. Again, it's this binding of this mental the the memes that are in the realm of the mind with the processes of the physiology. And, you know, that's really what uh, the study of consciousness kind of is and mm. in, in understanding a person's worldview. But uh, but these manic and, you know, just the especially today, because the uh, the horrors of, tr you know, post-traumatic stress and, you know, and these are all just people that have had a situation tied to a story that has charged the physiology up really, really high into a literally life or death situation. And, you know, shedding and decoupling that is, is I mean, that's post-traumatic stress, you know, right there, right? Um, and, you know, just helping people unwind uh, their conditioning or using the, the, the energetic state that they were able to achieve and then being able to, to ground them and, and to stabilize them and just decouple the, uh, the thought process from the physiological state mm. is... Uh, is uh is you know huge i think that's kind of cool you find that's that kind of cool. burning man is burning kind of a free a free laboratory in a sense sense well it's self-selected too all all the fringe society people are there and then it's turning into a crazy cuz you know there you've got all these hardcore partiers there and you've got you know these silicon valley people that are there now and you know, there's, it's, it's just a big melting pot of stuff, you know, just for this whole psychedelic community and for people interested in trans. And if you think about it, the wild thing about, about Burning Man as a festival, it's almost engineered for transformation. Because if you think about it, you're stuck in the desert, everything that you need, you have to bring, you, you can't leave anything behind. And you're out in, in kind of really miserable conditions. <laughs> it's really hot, it's yeah. dusty and everything. And you have all this amazing art and you have all this emotional stuff going on with your camp mates and then, you know, relationships that are happening and jealousy. And so the psychological stuff that, and then there's a temple, you know, which burns, you know, and so it's, it's basically a pressure cooker for psychological energy, if you will, like as a group kind of thing. And it all gets, it all gets released at the end of the week with the, with the, the burning of the man and then the burning of the temple and everything. And, uh, you know, it's 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 kind of engineered Sounds for awesome. yeah. getting you into the unknown. You know, it's taking you from the known to the unknown, kicking the energy up, and then just seeing what happens. God, it sounds like a vast, vast uh, sweat lodge in a sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, so, what, what were your uh, camping facilities there? Because, like you said, you, you have to 
you know, there's nothing available. Like, I, I guess, you know, you have to yeah, bring your well, own well, water, your own we, food. I lucked out. Yeah, I lucked out. The people that I was with uh, had an RV, and and there are some nice camps there. There, are a lot of people that are, you know, if you ever go, uh, if you want to go, we'll probably have a, a group going uh, this coming year. Mm. Um, but uh, there are people that have gone for 10, 15 years. They they kind of know what to do, and if you can hook on with one of those groups, you know, that's best. But a lot of the people that you know. Like I was really lucky. You, you you probably know Nick Day, right? Yeah. 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 So Nick and Maurizio used to go, you know, early on in. And I, I remember I, I I went to Walmart for the first time. <laughs> yeah. So we spent like six hours at Walmart with Nick Day, and he was basically telling us what we needed and and everything. And and so getting advice from people is helpful. Um, but uh, it's uh, I mean it's you know the art there and. You know, for me, it was just a lot of work. I just met a lot of people and ended up connecting with a lot of people. Mm. And then we started these experiments with these manic depressives and, you know, with these psychoactive substances and everything. But, um, but uh, so for me, it was work. But it was, I mean, just the art and everything. It was just really mm. beautiful. And But a lot of other people that were there, they were hooking up. There's, you know, just lots of really people running around naked and, uh, yeah, really. You'd have a day there. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for, uh, they have like this big orgy tent as well too. I mean, it's just really oh crazy stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got to get out of the house more. <laughs> <laughs> well, we should do these road trips. You know, you, you have this idea, and I, I'm kind of doing this thing in Europe. You know, we'll be in the U.S. in April, and but I'd love, and I'm planning on doing this annually, at least for the next ten years, and so. uh so yeah, I'd love to plan with you, see what we could do. Yeah, yeah. My thing would be to, like I, I said to you just in chat, would be to, uh, you know, using just online to kind of seed some meetup groups in different cities and wherever yep. you're going around yeah. the world, so that when we yeah. get there, there's actual there's actually a meeting happening. And yeah. Then maybe yeah. Then when we leave, we can follow up and uh, and well, if you, know, you can keep it, keep if it going. We can figure out. If you can figure out a way, and this is something I've been trying to encourage Maurizio with sand and everything, but uh, this is, again, one of the beautiful things about TED is, uh, <clears throat> you know, they did this TED at conference, which was more mainstream and, you know, more inspirational and everything. But then they, they as an experiment, they did this TEDx thing, you know, so yeah, actually I'm the curator for TEDx Hong Kong, but there have been over... I don't know, three, 5,000 different TEDx events that have gone on all around the world, which are basically organized by local people using kind of the TED format and the TED paradigm, and they, they lend them the TED brand, calling mm. it TEDx. Yeah. And then they have a couple of videos that people can show. And so they, they've got a really great network all around the world. And what I've been doing, you know, actually for this Entrepreneurship Innovation and Self-Discovery program is I've been networking with some of the TEDx organizers. You know, the, the one in Berlin is helping to promote the stuff that we're doing in Berlin. Oh. And, uh, and, you know, I know the people mostly in Asia, but I'm kind of reaching out to some of the ones that are in, in Europe. They're all kind of, you know, ideas worth spreading. And, you know, I don't really do the spiritual stuff so much, but in terms of innovation yeah. and entrepreneurship and, you know, that these these kind of heroes journey you know the modern mm -hmm. heroes of today are the entrepreneurs and and you know reaching out to that community that network is is really good and they've got some really great amazing people. yeah I, th I think i think yeah the sure the uh interconnection of all the TED, if, tedx groups could, is amazing yeah but if you could do something like if we could do something like that either with the sand stuff that marito has got or you know the stuff that you're doing with these interviews and stuff um and and or even just building a builder bu building a bigger community i know there are some groups actually there's a woman i know in toronto that i can hook you up with should i have to remember her name but she's got a massive media library and there's another guy in san francisco that i know that have been trying to do they've been trying to do cable channels and stuff before and then a friend of mine i can hook you up with a very good friend of mine is a guy named robert lawrence coon and he's mm -hmm. got a tv show called closer to truth that's on cable shows, and if you Google that, uh, you can come up with his website. And he's got a bunch of interview stuff as well, too. Yeah. But to get people to really inquire into – and his big thing is consciousness, cosmos, and God. And if you can get you know, organizations or 
groups getting together, maybe even having dinners, sponsored dinners, or you know, locally from local businesses in the, in the community for that, you know, towards supporting this kind of infrastructure, that would be really awesome. And, yeah. you know, working towards something like that would be really great. Yeah, you know, it's really, it's really pretty neat bringing people together and raising that energy towards, uh, towards, yeah. awake, towards awakening at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we're both doing our stuff, man. I don't know, you know, when, and, yeah. and it's good, it's good, you, it's good <laughs> you and I came together. We have, we have different mindsets and it's good that we're coming together and we'll try to, uh, you know, we, there's a lot of overlap because we have, yeah. at, at the bottom line, our interest is the same and we pursue it in different ways. Yeah, same uh, team. Same team. Yeah. All right, man. Good. Thanks. Gino, have a good night and thank you right. for your time. All right. Okay. Thanks. Bye, man. Take care. Bye.